Okay, so at the end of every NFL season, a couple of things always happen. A few teams go to the playoffs, a few other teams start to try and figure out what went wrong, and somewhere in between all that, a whole bunch of dudes get fired. The turnover rate of NFL coaches is so high, and so well known in fact, that there's even kind of a national holiday to commemorate it. Or whatever the opposite of a holiday would be, I guess. It's called Black Monday, and it happens the day after the regular season ends. This year alone, six different guys lost their jobs on Black Monday, including, to a lot of people's surprise, Brian Flores, who'd nearly gotten the Dolphins to the playoffs after starting 1-7. and seven. Two more coaches, John Gruden and Urban Meyer, were fired at other times, and Sean Payton retired, meaning that nine different teams, over a quarter of the league, were looking for new head coaches this offseason. And with that many open jobs out there, I had the same question that I'm sure a lot of other people did. Is this finally going to be the year when someone hires Eric Bieniemy? I mean, it seemed overdue before we even got to this point. Bieniemy has been the Chiefs' offensive coordinator since 2018, which, in case you'd forgotten, has been a very successful period for that franchise. It certainly helps that Patrick Mahomes came to the Chiefs around that time too, but the guy has been with the team for four straight AFC Championship game appearances, and two trips to the Super Bowl, and of course, their first title since 1970. The Chiefs have also been in the top five in offensive efficiency every year since bieniemy has been in the job, and while yes, Andy Reid is the team's play caller, I think it'd be pretty unfair to downplay Bieniemy's involvement in the development of that offensive unit, including Patrick Mahomes. And yet, as the Vikings announced that they were hiring Kevin O'Connell, and the dust finally settled on that insane coaching carousel, Bieniemy is still the Chiefs' offensive coordinator. None of the nine teams that needed a new coach thought that he was the right guy for them, and similarly to the situation with Brian Flores, that just seems kind of insane. Like, what does this guy have to do to be good enough for someone to hire him? Build a great offense? Win a Super Bowl? Help develop one of the best quarterbacks of the past 20 years? He's done literally all of those things, and yet, he's still going to be in that same job. I mean, I guess it's a win for the Chiefs to get him for another season, but I can't help but think that it's a loss for the NFL. I'd say the same for Byron Leftwich, who's also a Super Bowl winning coordinator, and will also be in that job for at least another year. And you might know where I'm going with this, probably because you read the title of the video, but winning a title as an assistant is not the only two things that those two guys, as well as Brian Flores, have in common. The NFL has a problem. Pretty big one, if you ask me. But before I spell it out, I just want to address the fact that yes, we are going to be talking about race in this episode. And if that means that you're automatically going to click away from the video, then bye, I guess. But I would suggest that you maybe don't, because this is an important discussion to have. For a lot of people in the NFL, and in the country as a whole, race plays a big part in shaping their experience, and to just ignore it would be pretty irresponsible. And because these are people's lives and legacies that we're talking about and not a game of Uno, no one should be accused of playing the race card for bringing it up. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's dig into the question at hand. Why are there so few black coaches in the NFL right now? It's a tricky question to even approach trying to answer, but in our best attempt to do so, we're going to look at it through two separate lenses. First, what does the data say? And second, how can we use psychology to understand that data? Let's start with the simple fact that, with the firing of Brian Flores and the hiring of Lovey Smith and Mike McDaniel, which is a net positive of one, that brings us to exactly three black head coaches in the NFL, out of a possible 32. That means if you take out Ron Rivera and Robert Sala, who are the only other men of color on that list, you're left with 27 white dudes. And in a league where most estimates put the percentage of black players at at least 60%, the likelihood of the men leading the teams they play on being of their same race is under 20. And that's not great to start with, but there's a lot more data on the issue and a lot more to those numbers than just that. Lots of studies have looked at the statistical relationship between race and the likelihood of being hired as a head coach, but a recent one out of Kennesaw State University caught my eye. So I reached out to the guy that wrote it, Dr. Josh Pitts, to see what the paper was all about, and to see how he got interested in studying this question in the first place. It all started when he published another paper in 2014 about the racial breakdown of football players switching positions after high school, and the response it ended up getting. Because I published that paper, I would get, you know, these reporters contacting me, asking me about certain questions, uh, you know, anytime something came up with like race and sports. And so in 2018, I started getting the same question over and over again from reporters. Why isn't Eric Bieniemy a head coach yet, you know? Uh, 
And, and, and so uh, why is there a lack of black head coaches in the NFL? And because he's a professional researcher, and I don't think he'd mind me saying, a bit of a nerd, Dr. Pitts thought he could give it a shot. I was tired of having to, uh, you know, just sort of guess about it. And I was like, let's, let's find out the answer to, to this question, you know, because this is something we can do. This study only came out at the beginning of February, but it provides some very interesting insight into what we can and can't understand about the NFL hiring process. This study looked at over 1,100 data points on over 250 NFL coordinators from the point that the Rooney Rule was introduced in 2003 to the present day. The Rooney Rule, in case you weren't aware, is a league regulation that requires teams to interview at least one minority candidate for their head coach and senior football operations positions. Now, there's nothing in the rule that says they have to hire a minority candidate, only that they have to interview one. And there's been some alleged hanky-panky that's come out about that recently, but more on that in a bit. Basically, this study treated every coordinator season as a different data point, and then charted the movement of those coordinators over the data collection period. If you want to take a closer look at their methods, I'll include a link to the study itself in the description of the video. So, what did they find? A lot of things, but... It's hard to make sense of some of them without using examples to put them into context. Like we mentioned in the last episode, though, that's where case studies can be particularly useful. Which brings us back to Eric Bieniemy and why no one's hired him yet. According to Dr. Pitts' study, as well as a couple of other studies from the past couple of years that I looked at, there actually isn't a huge difference in the percentage of black coordinators that get hired compared to white ones. The hiring pool for black coordinators, however, is much, much smaller, which makes that number a lot less encouraging. We'll talk about why that might be in a bit, but just to start with, Eric Bieniemy is already in a statistical minority. He's also an offensive coordinator with an offensively-minded head coach, which this study found to be a significant determinant of a coach's hireability. That didn't seem to be as much of an issue for the two guys who had the same job before him, but I digress. Bieniemy's background as a player isn't doing him any favors either. Bieniemy was a running back in Colorado in the late 80s and early 90s, and even though he was a very good running back, this study found that coaches were about five times less likely to be hired if they played that position than if they played quarterback. There's a pretty clear pipeline from the quarterback room to the head coach's office, even if, and maybe especially if, the guy was never the number one option. A lot of times you see these guys like Doug Peterson, Jason Garrett, um, you know, Frank Reich. All three of those guys all played quarterback in the NFL. None of them were starters, though, you know. Peterson was behind Farr, right behind Kelly, and Garrett behind Aikman. Uh, so what we need more of in the NFL is uh, more Brett Hundleys, you know, more journeymen, more Byron Leftwiches, you know, even though Byron did start for a little while. Uh, but, but guys like that because – and it almost seems like being a backup quarterback in the NFL is kind of like a crash course in how to become a head coach, you know. And those guys are, you know, historically have always been white. According to this study, Bienemy would actually have been about as likely to get hired if he hadn't played in college at all, or if he'd been a defensive player instead. Linebackers and corners are way more likely to become head coaches than running backs, but independently of the position they played, the defensive side of the ball is where the majority of black coordinators get hired to be head coaches from. If you just think for a second about some of the most successful black head coaches in the NFL, whether it's Mike Tomlin, Tony Dungy, Lovey Smith, Marvin Lewis, Todd Bowles, Brian Flores, Leslie Frazier, Raheem Morris, or a number of others, all of them were hired from the defensive side. Which is not where Eric Bieniemy or his contemporary Byron Leftwich, have ever coached. In Bieniemy's case, he played the wrong position, he's got the wrong boss, he's coaching on the wrong side of the ball, and, to top it all off, he might be the wrong race. According to the regression run in this study, Eric Bieniemy's probability of being hired after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl in 2019 was just 36%. That still seems pretty low, but when you match it up against the other variables we've just discussed, it makes a little more sense. Had he been white, however, that probability jumps all the way up to 54%. By contrast, Kevin Stefanski, who had not just won a Super Bowl, had a probability of over 61% when he was hired that same offseason. But like, why? Remember that that's at the heart of everything we're doing with psychology. Not just describing what's happening, but also doing our best to understand the reason behind it. It's not really all that helpful to simply point out that a black coach seems to be passed over for jobs, even if he deserves it. See, every one of those jobs going to someone else is a decision in and of itself. And to really try and figure out what might be going on here, we need to take a good, long look at the potential motivations for those decisions. 
and that begins with understanding the people making them. One of the things you see reported relatively frequently about Eric Bieniemy is that he isn't a very good interviewer, and that that's hurt him in a lot of these coaching searches. Now, personally, I find it kind of hard to believe that a guy who's had multiple jobs and been around the NFL for like 30 years wouldn't know how to talk to people in the NFL, but let's assume for the moment that that's true. Even if Eric Bieniemy is a terrible interviewer, to the point that it would invalidate all of his obvious success in the league, there's still another side to that discussion. Because interviews are a two-way conversation, and if there's a breakdown on one of those sides, it might say more about the interviewer than it does about the interviewee. We're venturing into the territory of what's known in psychology as implicit bias, which is the idea that we as people may favor one particular outcome, choice, or even type of person over another without realizing it. And I need to emphasize here that this is a problem for literally everyone. In a study that featured more than 600 papers, one review from 2017 found that systemic implicit bias existed in the healthcare community, an environment where you'd think that everyone would be going for the same outcomes. But no, doctors and nurses had biases towards people of certain races, genders, ages, weights, whether the person was at fault for being in the hospital in the first place, or even their disease history. No one is immune to this, if you'll pardon the medical pun. And people in the NFL front offices are no exception. Because I don't know if you know this about NFL executives, but most of them are white. And not only does implicit bias usually mean that we favor people that look like us, but we also more readily buy into whatever it is they're selling us. So if you're an NFL general manager, and you're white, you're less likely to take a chance on someone like Eric Bieniemy or Byron Leftwich than you are on, say, Kevin O'Connell. And this does appear to be an NFL-specific problem, because in the NBA, another league with a significant majority of black players, about half the coaches are also black. Still not entirely representative of the player population, but much, much closer than the NFL is. So why might that be? How is the NBA getting this right, or at least mostly right, where the NFL might not be? Personally, I think it comes down to a kind of narrative, and specifically narratives that are related to a player's position. Now, this is what we refer to in psychology as a theory, and because I don't have much research to back it up, it definitely borders on reckless speculation, but we're going to go there anyway, because I think it's a valid point. My theory is that NBA players have a greater platform to showcase the attributes that we usually associate with what makes a good coach, like leadership ability, intelligence, and tenacity. I mean, there's a reason that Chris Paul is the logo for this channel. He's one of the smartest players of his generation, and as a point guard, which is a very common position for an NBA coach to have played, he had his entire career to showcase that. So did coaches like Doc Rivers, Ty Lue, and Chauncey Billups, and several others. And we talked earlier about how certain positions are more likely to become head coaches in the NFL, and how certain positions are typically occupied by black or white players. One of the main findings of Dr. Pitt's study was that positions like quarterback, and also tight end, were pretty strong correlates to becoming a head coach. But from a research perspective, why might that be? When you really sit down and think about it, these guys do a lot of stuff, especially today. You know, I mean, Travis Kelsey, he might line up at wide receiver on one play, split out wide. He might line up in the slot on one play, on either side of the of the formation. Um, he might pass block or run block. So, you know, outside of the quarterback, there might not be another position on the on the team at which the guy needs to be really familiar with all the different things that we're trying to accomplish. The tight end thing sort of took Josh and his research team by surprise compared to the quarterback one. But just looking at the current crop of coaches, Dan Campbell, Robert Sala, and Mike McCarthy all played tight end in college. But what could make playing that position over another a strong predictor of becoming a head coach? These guys sort of just get a good crash course and how to become a head coach is, you know, it's just a, a positive side effect similar to being the backup quarterback who never really plays, but he has to prepare to play. And, you know, when, when the team's defense goes on the field, that backup quarterback is over there with the clipboard, you know, trying to coach up the starter. And, and so I think you're just, you're, you're learning how to coach in, in those roles. So between tight end and backup quarterback, there seems to be a sense that these positions require a lot of football IQ to play and coach well. And from that, we could say that there's a correlation between the position that someone plays, as well as the experience and exposure that playing it gave them, and their ability to advance from coordinator to head coach. We may never be able to prove that definitively, but 
My theory is that the lack of ability to develop or even show off the traits that we typically associate with great head coaches, especially when compared to how that works in the NBA, could be damaging to the cases of black candidates in the NFL. If you're a GM and you've got a vision in your head of an offensive wizard who will take charge of your franchise and lead it to the promised land, a quarterback seems like a logical choice. And because you're most likely white, you may have a vision in your head of what a quarterback, and by extension all that other stuff, actually looks like. And if you're a career running backs coach who doesn't look the part in quite the same way, you may be out of luck. And if that happens over and over again, you've got a systemic issue, which seems to be where we are today. And I know that this is uncomfortable to talk about. Believe me, I do. There's a reason that this video is longer than all the other ones, and that I included way more research and references to the people out there actually doing the work. And those people don't have the answers either. Dr. Pitts has spent years of his life studying this stuff and still doesn't know exactly how to account for these discrepancies. We are careful, I think, not to come out and say we found evidence of discrimination. Uh, what we can say is that we found evidence that these results are consistent with discrimination. So in other words, it's not like we can do these studies and be like, we know. <laughs> uh, you know, it's more like, again, just trying to find what are these results pointing to, you know, what does it look like it's pointing to? Maybe, maybe black coordinators in the NFL really are being discriminated against. I, I don't know if that's true, you know. Um, again, all we can say is that our findings are consistent with that. My pursuit of this topic doesn't have anything to do with being on some personal crusade to get Eric bien a job, although, cards on the table, I do think he deserves a shot at one. It's because black players, regardless of what position they play, deserve an equal chance to become coaches, who then become coordinators, who then become head coaches, and maybe even beyond that. And while the Rooney Rule was an attempt to make that happen, teams have just found a way around it. And even if it was doing exactly what it was designed to do, there's not really a clear understanding from the league or otherwise of what success in that area would actually look like. I don't know what the right number is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh I say it like this, if black person's share of NFL coaches should mirror their share of the players, then we're way off base because, you know, that, that means there should be like 22, 23 of the head coaches should, should be black. If instead, you know, it should mirror um, their share of the U.S. population, which is like 13, 14%, then, they're, then the NFL's not that far off. I really don't think that teams are deliberately denying black coaches who want to move up. Like, I don't think that every NFL boardroom is just a bunch of white dudes twirling their mustaches and trying to figure out new ways to be racist. But there again, that's kind of the point. Implicit bias isn't like explicit bias, where we can just obviously see that someone is a jerk and then serve them the consequences. The people making these decisions probably aren't jerks at all. They're just people, and people have prejudices, whether they realize it or not. And as far as solutions go, I don't really have one. Neither does Dr. Pitts, and this is part of his job. It is a massive topic, uh, a massively important topic to which we contribute, but, you know, we didn't find the smoking gun and, and have all the answers to solve all of the NFL's problems. So, yeah, I think it would have been weirder if you had, <laughs> if, you, if you had come across this thing and been like, yes, this is it. I don't know exactly why there are so few black coaches in the NFL, and I don't think anyone else does either. But there are. It's probably not because of any one thing, if we're honest. It's probably the combination of a bunch of different variables, and race is probably one of them. And on that note, as far as solutions go, recognizing the problem is almost always a good place to start. Three black head coaches out of 32 is not good for absolutely anyone. Because at the end of the day, do you want your team to miss out on the next Mike Tomlin or Tony Dungy because your GM didn't recognize their own bias? Do you want some brilliant future coach to never get his start because he was passed over for coaching the wrong position or for not being what someone imagined? I don't, for a multitude of reasons, chief of which is because it's the wrong thing to do. It's unjust and unwise, and repeated enough times, it creates a cycle that becomes almost impossible to break. For things to actually be fair, though, and for talented men like Eric Bieniemy to really have an equal chance of getting their shot, it's going to have to be.
thank you all so much for sticking around till the end of this thing. I'm Will, and this was an absolutely exhausting episode to put together, but I'm so glad I did. This is easily the most important episode I've done so far, and I hope the conversation isn't over. I know this can be a tricky topic to discuss, but I want this channel and this community to be a place that encourages that kind of thing. If you have thoughts about Eric Bieniemy or Brian Flores, or the Rooney Rule, or the state of NFL hiring in general, please put them in the comments or send me a tweet. I don't want anyone to say anything too contentious or mean to a fellow community member, but I'd love to keep the discussion going, because like I said, I think it's incredibly important. We'll be doing just that the next time I see you, but until then, adios. <laughs> <laughs>